Dear principal, distinguished faculty and staff, fellow students of the Word of God, I want to begin my sermon by thanking you for the great honor of inviting me to share from God's Word. It is indeed my joy to be here among you all this morning, and I hope to be an encouragement to you as I unfold God's Word, God's Word before you. But before that, let's pray one more time. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word and learn from it this morning. Oh, Father, would you please help us by your spirit to see Christ and his glory through the preaching of your living word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me begin with this sovereign statement. Hear this. Just you like Jesus doesn't mean you are a Christian. There are many who aren't Christian, yet they like Jesus and they respect him much. Hindu leader Mahatma Gandhi was a great fan of Jesus. Listen to him, what he wrote about Jesus. Gentle figure of Christ, so patient, so kind, so loving, so full of forgiveness that he taught his followers not to retaliate when abused or struck, but to turn the other cheek. But I thought it was a beautiful example of the perfect man. There were plenty of other men like Gandhi who esteemed Jesus as a great teacher, a prophet, a miracle worker, but unfortunately none of them were Christians. You too may have friends who would speak well of Jesus and Christianity but are not Christians. There are people who would come, come to church with you, proudly wear a t-shirt that says Jesus loves you, love youth conferences and concerts, but sadly not genuine believers, not born again Christians. So, just you like Jesus doesn't mean you are a Christian. So we ask, what makes a true Christian? How can you know whether someone is a Christian? Let's consider this morning uh, what the Bible has to say on this matter. Please turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Twenty-seven to thirty-one. I read. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciple, "What do the pe- what do people say that I am?" And they told him, "John the Baptist." And others say, "Eliza." And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, "But what do you say that I am?" Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell no one, not to tell anyone about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So we will learn one main thing from this text this morning. One main thing. A true Christian would personally confess that Jesus is Christ. Just one big idea of my sermon today. A true Christian would personally confess that Jesus is Christ. What does that mean practically? Let's look at this from the text. And if you have read Mark, I hope you know the purpose statement of the book in chapter 1. Verse 1, it says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So in the beginning of the book, Mark tells his reader what to expect subsequently. When we come to the baptism of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, we hear a voice from the Father in heaven declaring Jesus is his beloved Son. Even demons recognized Jesus' divine sonship in chapter 3. 
But until chapter 8, no human lips had confessed Jesus is Christ. Peter's confession in chapter 8 is the first human confession in Mark's narrative. So chapter 8, therefore, is the turning point of the book of Mark's gospel. And this begins with Jesus asking a destiny-determining question. Please look at verse 27. And on the way, he asks his disciple, What do people say that I am? Jesus asks the same question in two stages. Who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? So who do people say that Jesus is? Or who does this people here refer to? You know, we have seen these people throughout the gospel who were amazed at the teaching of Jesus. People who have seen demons, storms, and sea submitting to him. We have seen these people who have witnessed him performing many miracles. And now look at their answer. Verse 28. And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Eliza, and others one of the prophets. Some say JTB, John the Baptist. It seems many had agreed with Herod that Jesus was John whom Herod beheaded had been raised. People thought that. And others say Eliza. And we know that according to Malachi 3 and 4, it was expected that before the great day of the Lord, Eliza would return. And people thought that Jesus was Eliza. And others say Jesus is one of the prophets. In fact, according to Deuteronomy 18, chapter 18, a prophet like Moses was expected to come. And people thought that he has arrived quite close. The disciples got three different answers. Answers from people, three different different opinions of people regarding Jesus. So, what do you think of these answers? What do these answers have in common? Although these answers, you know, sound very respectful and commendable, they actually confine Jesus to the category of the prophets alone. People then fail to recognize the true identity of Jesus. And how about people today? What do people say that who Jesus is? The opinions regarding Jesus is not uniform. Some say Jesus is a good moral teacher like Gautama Buddha. Others say Jesus is a miracle worker, a healer, mixture, fix it. In Islam, Jesus is understood to be the pen ultimate, that is, second to last, prophet and messenger of God. One of my Hindu friends once told me that Jesus is just a byproduct of Christian people. What he meant was that Jesus was fabricated. He was invented. He's not real. The list can go on and on. What a tragic mistake to dismiss Jesus in such a way. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't seem to be very concerned about what others say who he is. If you look at the text, what matters to him the most is what his disciples think of him. Therefore, Jesus asks the same question to his disciples in verse 21, 29. And he asks them, but... What do you say that I am? Consider the conjunction here. But. The question here begins with but. This is the most important and central question in the entire book of Mark. And I believe this is the most important question for all of us today. And your answer to this question determines whether you are an insider or outsider in the kingdom of God. A true disciple must know and personally confess who Jesus is. What you say, who Jesus is, matters more than what people say, what your friends say, 
what your family say. So let me ask you, friends, what do you say? Who Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? Your answer should not differ from Peter's. Please look down for Peter's answer at verse 29b. Peter answered him, You are the Christ. Or, you are the Messiah, the anointed one of God. See, Christ is not a surname for Jesus. Jesus Christ is not like Isai Rai. Christ is a title, a very famous title in the Old Testament. Christ means the anointed one. And you know, in the Old Testament, only kings, priests, and prophets were anointed. Later, the anointing, anointing continued with just kings. And if you are familiar with the history of Israel, you know that for 600 years, the Davidic throne remained empty of a man to sit on it. But it was promised then that one day God himself would be the king and he would rule with perfect righteousness and justice. That's Isaiah 9. And Mark tells us that this Jesus was God in the flesh, king sitting right in front of Peter. This Jesus, Peter realized, was the anointed one. The one who's been set apart for a specific purpose, the promised Messiah, the Savior, the King, and God himself. Friends, Peter was not passing on his comments here. But in fact, he was making a bold declaration saying, you are the Christ. And his claim excludes King Caesar and any other kings. It was bow disgracing, Caesar dethroning claim. Not just a simple comment. But what kind of king is Jesus? What kind of Messiah is he? His Messiahship leads to his mission. That's verse 30 to 31. Please look down at your Bible to verse 30 and 31. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. To people's surprise, Jesus was a suffering king. Who would come, suffer, die, and rise again. You know, for Jewish people, including the disciples here, the suffering of Messiah was unthinkable. The suffering of king was unthinkable. And you know that when you you know keep on reading, you get that. People thought that Jesus had come to carry the warrior's sword. But he actually had come to take on a servant's towel. So why was it necessary that God take on human place, live as a human being, suffer and die as a man? Because God could not sweep our sin under the rug. The righteous and just God couldn't just ignore our sin, pretend like it never happened. That means, friends, we were in trouble. We were dead in our sins. And we needed someone to save us from. We were not able to measure up to God's standard. And we were all under God's wrath. And we needed someone to take that wrath from us and for us. So that we could live. We needed a savior. We needed a messiah. We needed a substitute. And thank God, this son of man in verse 31, derived from Daniel 7, the son, of, the man of sorrows foretold in Isaiah 53, is Jesus Christ who came to take our place. He lived a perfect life and that we failed to live, and he died on the cross, our death, 
and rose again from the death. That's what Peter's confessions apply or imply. That's what you should mean when you say that Jesus is Christ. Friends, just you like Jesus doesn't necessarily mean you are a Christian. You have good feelings about Jesus doesn't mean you are a Christian. Being a Christian means you know him, you believe in him, you trust him and him alone to save you from your sin. Friends, do you know this Jesus? Now you might be objecting in your mind, what is this guy saying? Do you know Jesus? What an irrelevant question. Of course, we all know him. We're all seminarians here. We study about God. We do theology. We write tons of paper on the life and ministry of Jesus. We study synoptic gospel, compare gospel. Of course, we know Jesus. Friends, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not asking you an academic intellectual question, for it is very easy to give an academic intellectual answer. I think Satan knows theology more than you and I do. I'm asking you whether you know him, you know Jesus intimately. I'm asking you whether you have faith in him. I'm asking you whether you have a relationship with him. Friends, knowing Jesus is not an academic exercise. Let me be honest with you here. I was awarded an excellent academic award when I graduated from this college in 2010. As I went forward to receive my award, everyone applauded. People cheered up. Parents were proud of me. But you know what? Nobody knew except myself or God that I was lost in my sin. I was like a whitewashed tomb. Looked beautiful on the outside, but rotten on the inside. I finished my BTS with big brain, but with heart disease. I was just another theology gig, someone who saw theology as an end in itself rather than a means to an end. Friends, it is possible to deceive yourself thinking that you are doing okay when you are actually not. I feel terrible to say this, that there was a student who was awarded heart award while his illegitimate child was growing in his girlfriend's womb. It's terrible. Oh, friends, your score does not equal your growth. Your grade does not equal your growth. It is possible to graduate with all A's, but never change, never transformed. Friends, I don't know you very well. I don't know your condition. I don't live here with you. But I want you to burn this in your head that your future ministry doesn't depend on your knowledge or skill. Let me repeat myself. Your future ministry does not depend on your knowledge or your skills, but on the condition of your heart. Your heart needs to be shaped by the gospel daily. Are you becoming experts in the gospel without being exposed and changed by it? Are you becoming more and more grieved, broken, and convicted by the masses of the Bible or just getting comfortable and casual toward it? As you study day after day, are you academically too busy? I know you should be busy doing your assignments. But are you too busy that you don't have a time to sit down, open your Bible, read, contemplate, and pray? I know this is very ironic. That we don't read the Bible in Bible colleges. I scarcely, I scarcely, I barely read my Bible during my seminary. I regret I, I did not. I was too concerned with my assignments, then my soul. Maybe that's some of you. Please don't do that. Only a fool would do that. That's what Jesus meant in verse 36. If you look at verse 36 here, what Jesus says. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? The answer is nothing. Nothing. If you achieve all the world's, all the world's education, but risk your soul, what does it profit you? Nothing. It took me seven years to understand this. It took me seven years to understand this truth. Friends, if you found yourself distant from Jesus this morning, if you realize that you know Jesus only on the surface, if you found yourself guilty of being too concerned about grades than your characters, or if the Lord just revealed your sin to you, I plead with you, I plead with you, run to Christ. Repent of your sin and rest in Him. And if you need help, don't pretend, don't be ashamed, don't freak out, but, but with humility, approach your friends, your teachers, your pastors. Open up your life to them. Let them help you. Let them come into your life. Let me say one more time. Just you like Jesus doesn't mean you are a Christian. Just you have a good feeling about Jesus doesn't mean you are a Christian. Just because you cry during singing doesn't mean you are a Christian. Being a Christian means you too must be ready like Peter to confess that Jesus is Christ. And with time, it will be known by your life and by your conduct whether your confession was truly a confession of heart. So, who do you say Jesus is? Let's pray.